If you've been on social media in the last couple weeks, you've probably seen videos like these. What's happening, people? It's that time of the year again, a little bit later than usual, but it's new kit day. And today, I've got this bad boy to unbox. Hello and welcome to We're Not Really Here. This is a special edition because it is new kit day. Yes, our brand new kit has launched here and you can get yours. It is With the new season only a month away, fans are eager to get their hands on their favorite club's new shirts. But where do they come from and how are they manufactured? Is it ethical? Today, we look at the practices of companies like Nike, Adidas, and Puma and ask, what is the human cost of making football kits? I think that uh, football fans should definitely be concerned about the origin of where their shirts and other gear comes from. Paul Rowland is a transparency coordinator for the Clean Clothes campaign. Because there is a lot of injustice uh, in the supply chains, people have a right to deserve to know where their money goes and where it doesn't go. How much does it cost to manufacture one of these shirts and how much do they typically sell for? Well, the the Premier League shirts sell for up to seventy pounds a shirt and they cost about seventy pence to make, so about one percent. And that is in the production by workers. So that's yeah, that, worker that's what production. And en ends up in the uh, as the workers' wages. Of course there's more production costs and raw materials. Um, and suppliers, but they make up about 10% of the price. The workers' wages is actually about 1%. Wow, so that's a, a tiny portion of the overall cost for one of these shirts. Yes. So where are most of these shirts being manufactured? Where in the world? Mostly in Asia. Um, a lot of it is in Indonesia. There's also significant production in uh, Vietnam, in China, in uh, Myanmar, Burma. Uh, but a lot of it is concentrated in Indonesia. Well, let's, let's talk about or focus on Indonesia. You know, can you give an example of kind of the working conditions some of these laborers face in Indonesia? Yes, they work very long hours. Uh, officially, the working week is 48 hours a week, but overtime is chronic. And the workers tend to do that also because just to make ends meet. For a normal, uh, for a 48 hour uh, work week, uh, they would get about, uh, well, between uh, 82 and 200 euros per month. That's a wide span, and that is because in Indonesia, the minimum wage is staggered by region, because some regions are more expensive to live in. So around Jakarta, it's about 200 euros per month, and in the further away areas, it can be 100 or even less. And so what would a living wage be in Indonesia? It would be almost double. So the calculations go to around 363 euro, and that would be enough to pay your rent and pay your health care and send your kids to school and, well, things you would expect to do from a salary. That's quite a big shift between, you know, 82 euros per month or, you know, even 100, 200 to 363. I mean, that's, you know, double is quite a lot. Yes, yes. It means that most workers are in chronic debt. They also need to have every member of the family working there from quite a young age. So when we're talking about big companies, big multinational companies like Nike, Adidas, Puma, and some of these other ones, just how transparent are they? You know, I've seen multiple reports recently that Uyghur Muslims are working in forced labor camps and they are indirectly contributing to these companies. Are global brands such as Volkswagen, Mercedes-Benz, Nike and others using products made by ethnic Uyghurs under forced labor? A report by an Australian think tank claims that is the case. So how much do we know about them and you know, their supply chains? We do not know quite enough. Um, there has been a shift due to a lot of campaigning. So most of the sportswear brands actually do now disclose their tier one factories, as it's called. So that's the first layer of uh, subcontracting. 
that wasn't the case a number of years ago, but by now most of them do publish those, but they don't publish anything further down the supply chain. So where the cotton comes from, where the fabric is made, where it is spun. And yes, indeed, a lot of the, 20% of the world's cotton uh, is basically coming from slave labor in, uh, from China in the uh, Uyghur region. But also the cotton fields where the cotton is grown in Uzbekistan, there are, there's a lot of child labor there still. And even the seeds production, which takes place in Benin in Africa, of all places, um, is also uh, well known for child labor and other laborized abuses. So we know sort of like where the end factories are, but uh, hardly any brand will tell where uh, the material comes from further down the supply chain. So we know the tier one, which is kind of the most basic, but there's still like how many tiers kind of beneath that, you know, does it go? Usually tier three and four. So tier three is the spinning and the mills and then the dyeing of the fabric. Below that is actually the picking of the cotton and the, the, yeah, the milling of the cotton. You know, so let's just go like stick with tier one for the moment and, you know, the upper levels. You know, what kind of standards or regulations are there typically for these types of companies? You know, I know Nike says that its factories are obliged to follow company, quote, code leadership standards, which are some of the highest in our industry. Yeah, that's kind of a bit of PR spin. Well, actually, they are not the worst in the industry, but that's more an indictment upon the whole industry. They are filled with glowing words that the workers should be treated fairly. But if you go down to the nitty gritty, basically what it says, the uh, workers should be paid the minimum wage. We shall not do child labor. We shall not um, discriminate and do other things that are forbidden by law. So I could put it in, I will not kick puppies and say, this is my code leadership. So basically they're putting in a lot of things that are, that's the legal minimum standard. And that's about it. You mentioned before that Nike's actually, you know, not too bad compared to some of, you know, their competitors. How do they compare to other people in this space? For the sportswear, I would say they're slightly below average. There are some competitors that have had, have at least separated out the labor costs, which is kind of a technical thing, but it's very important to guarantee that there can be uh, decent wages. So Adidas has started doing that. Asics has started doing that. If you look at the wider garment industry, the fast fashion business, there are far worse offenders. As an example, in this current pandemic, Nike and their competitors have behaved relatively well, better than, say, Topshop or Peacock or some of the high street brands. So I would say they are just below average, but they are not as nice as their shining language uh, makes them look. Can you just explain a little bit further what maybe the difference between Nike and Adidas is? You mentioned, you know, that Adidas is a little bit better in disclosing some of that information. Yeah, Adidas has taken some concrete steps. Um, They also, they disclose more of their supply chain. So they go down a bit further the supply chain and they at least have published a way in which they uh, sort of ring fence the uh, worker salaries so that they do not become part of the negotiation with the suppliers. So that is an, it's a vital step in making sure that the suppliers do not uh, try to outbid each other by cutting costs uh, on workers' wages. So I just want to be clear, you know, so, so the issue with a lot of these companies is that you know, it's not like at the surface level or like, as you mentioned, the tier one, it's with the lower suppliers, maybe the people that supply even their suppliers. Yes, but also the also the tier one are pitted against each other as well. There is there's no brand in the world that actually owns a factory. They all um, outsource all of their production. So and then all these uh, supplier factories are basically bidding against each other to supply at the cheapest possible price, which, of course, means that the worker salaries will come under a squeeze. I read your report from 2018 called Foul Play, and in it you describe this supply chain practice known as lean management, and I think that's kind of what you were just hinting at there. Can you kind of explain 
lean management and how it impacts the supply chain process and therefore kind of this whole thing that we're talking about? Yeah, uh, lean management is basically a model where the companies don't own any of the factories. They don't uh, hold large amounts of products in stock. So there's always just-in-time production. Basically, that means that also the way the prices are calculated, um, they start with what do I want to sell this for and what do I want to keep out of that? So what's the profit margin? And then they basically put out a bid saying like, okay, who can manufacture this at this price? And then the suppliers have to compete against each other to meet that price, basically. And that means, of course, that that has a, a devastating impact on worker salaries. And the lean management is also, um, they make it so that the production is very easy to replicate. So if another country offers cheaper labor, they can basically pack up and go within a month because they don't have long running contracts with the suppliers. They can say like, oh, Vietnam offers us uh, even cheaper, and la cheaper labor by Indonesia. Uh, nice knowing you for 30 years, but we're gone. So in essence, they can keep the price on the production artificially low and force the suppliers to just meet that by any means possible. Yes, yes. That's the, that's the whole idea behind the model, and they have been incredibly successful at it. Wait, so just to kind of further that point a little bit. So essentially, they are deflecting kind of the responsibility onto these suppliers and putting the onus on them, really. Yes, yes. They say we have no responsibility for the whole supply chain. We just buy a finished product from a supplier and the supplier is responsible for paying the workers and keeping up all the other social requirements and keeping a safe factory. So they're basically offloading all their responsibility to the suppliers. And then they say like, okay, yeah, but that's what we're doing this in open negotiations. But they're ignoring the, the vast power imbalance between those suppliers and the brands. I mean, those brands are multi-billion dollar companies. And these factories, some of them can be larger. They have like four or 5,000 workers. But they have nowhere near the financial power of Adidas or Nike. So those negotiations are never fair to start with. In a response to an article in the Daily Telegraph on this issue, a Nike spokesperson said, quote, wage levels are set by suppliers and vary based on a variety of factors. Is this the company pretty much acknowledging that they pass the buck of, you know, humane working conditions and all of this onto their suppliers? Is that them kind of acknowledging that? Yes, that is them basically saying it's not our responsibility, the supplier should fix this, and we don't have anything to do with it. Where, of course, they have everything to do with it because they basically set the prices that they buy stuff for, and the suppliers have to operate in a very tiny margin to actually get the production. So, yeah, they are completely uh, passing on the buck to their suppliers. You said earlier that it wasn't always like this. Is it worse now than it used to be, or did it used to be worse? It is actually worse now than it used to be. Uh, I mean, some progress has been made, like some of the scandals of, let's say, the mid-80s involving child labor, they've been rooted out. But the share of the cost that's end up in a worker's pocket is now 30% uh, less than in the early 90s. Is that a 30% lower wage or is that 30% lower in relation to the economy? 30% lower in uh, like the percentage of the costs that go into workers' wages. The workers' wages have gone, well, they've stayed more or less the same, uh, some of the, uh, but have been hollowed out by inflation. But uh, nowadays, um, the workers' wages are, as said, 1%. And it used to be a, a much higher percentage of the retail price of a, of a shirt. Some people listening might say, well, while I understand workers might deserve more money, capitalism ensures fair competition and workers can always decline this work. What do you say to that? Yeah, but that assumes that the competition is fair. It's not. To stay in football terms, it's like pitting Manchester United versus New Mills or any eighth uh, level team. 
the competition is very unfair. And it's also not like these workers have options. They cannot say, well, shall I have an office job from nine to five or shall I work my butt off in a factory for these poverty wages? Hmm, let's choose the garment factory. Uh, it's not how this works. They do this to survive. They don't have options. Why do you think more changes haven't been made? Well, the assets, some major scandals have been rooted out, such as child labor. But the reasons why not nothing more has been done is um, this model of outsourcing, apart from driving down costs, also has the advantage of hiding things very nicely. It's really hard to directly connect factories to particular brands. And that way, they basically get off scot-free. And they are really good at PR. I mean, they have massive budgets on that. And um, yeah, they're quite good at it. So that's that's more or less the reason. And there has been a reluctance worldwide to enact more laws on this. That is slowly changing, but um, it's been a very, very long fight to get any government moving on this. Also because there is intense competition between countries. So as soon as a country did increase, for instance, the minimum wage, all the brands ran away to the next country. You said, you know, it's a good way of kind of hiding practices or, you know, getting away with things. Is that because you kind of build a labyrinth of, I use that supplier and that supplier uses another supplier. And then, you know, it's you, you build this web and it, it's hard to track down kind of the original culprit. Yes, there can be up to three layers of buying houses in between before you get at the first factory. So quite often the brands do not even have a direct uh, relationship to a factory, but they have it to an intermediary. Yeah, so that's that's basically, that makes it really hard to track. Uh, do football organizations or clubs acknowledge that there is a human cost to these products or are they mostly just kind of staying silent on the issue? They're mostly staying silent. There is now some movement uh, in FIFA. They have at least included uh, quite strict references to that uh, for their 2026 North American uh, bid. Also because they had massive criticism, of course, on the 2022 uh, Qatar World Championships, which has its own sets of problems with uh, builders and human rights. In the bid book um, for the uh, North American 2026, there is definite attention to supply chains and wages and other issues in the supply chain. So there is a, a slow movement towards it from the top level, but the individual clubs have mostly been silent. Why do you think fans should care about the human cost of this apparel? You know, why, why does it really matter? Um, well, it's the right thing to do. I mean, at its heart, uh, and I know football players are quite rich, but football is and always has been a working class game. And when you hand over 70 quid, which is a lot of money for me and for most people, I would think you just feel better when you know that the person making it can actually send their kids to school and feed their family. We've had a progression from, well, what is basically called the satanic dark mills of Northern England in the textile industry in the 1800s and 1900s. And that was abolished by basically the working class saying we've had enough of this. Although now with Leicester and uh, Boohoo seeming to want to turn the clock back. Broken windows patched up with cardboard. The workers inside largely shielded from view. How much are you paying? Yeah, I can't say that. You can contact to the boss. This is Leicester's textile industry. Hundreds of factories in crumbling buildings divided into a maze of workshops. No, it's the right thing to do. And it's also, it's completely possible. It's retail prices wouldn't be that much higher. Even on, I don't know, high street, cheap, T-shirts, retail prices would be like 5% higher. And on such a football shirt, if they were to pay a living wage, the working costs uh, or the part that they would have to pay the worker would go up uh, maybe 1%, but they could also easily absorb that and take a little bit less profit and skip on the third super yacht. So it, it's not like we're asking consumers or telling them like all your clothing will become twice as expensive when we start paying a living wage. It's gonna be a very mild increase and especially on these 70 pound shirts, that it, actually the price should still be the same. 
Do you see this changing in the medium or near future? Probably real change only with legislation. So the UK has the Modern Slavery Act, which is now uh, being revised to be a bit more strict. The EU will have human rights legislation and the EU's big market. So probably that will also influence the UK market. So I think in the end, it will require some legislation because also in the end, I would love for fans to become more vocal on this, but it's actually not something they should have to worry about. A basic level of decency should be guaranteed by law. If if you're buying something, you should actually be guaranteed like this was made under fair conditions. I should not be personally responsible every time I buy something to check out exactly how it was made. In the current situation, I love for people doing that. And we know that brands are very sensitive to their image. So it does help if people get a bit inquisitive on social media. But in the end, um, it should be a no-brainer. It should be guaranteed. Are you a fan of football today? Then why not support the show and sign up to our new Patreon page? You'll get access to bonus episodes, full interviews, and extra content. Just go on Patreon and search Football Today. Now, back to the episode. To get a different perspective, we spoke with sports apparel designer Rob Warner. Warner is the creative director of Spark and has worked in the sports apparel industry for more than 20 years for companies like Puma, Umbro, and Lululemon. Yeah, it was always a a very important topic. I mean, certainly during my time at Puma and and bearing in mind I started there in 2001, the, the business was already quite a long way ahead of a a large chunk of the industry in terms of their corporate and social responsibility. We had a team in there that were monitoring everything from the human side of manufacturing through to the restricted substance list. They were already on the way to becoming a paper-free company. We weren't using PVC in any of the badges or logos and things like that on kit. So it was already a a big deal at at Puma back then. And then similarly, going into Umbro under under Nike ownership and beyond, there was, I mean, Nike put a huge amount of stock into their uh, stance around corporate and social responsibility. So the same there, it was, you know, it was always just such a, a, a hugely important thing for the businesses and for the individuals working there. You mentioned how it was huge. Can you be a little bit more specific on what you mean by that? Like what actions or, you know, conversations took place? Yeah. So, I mean, across both businesses, any factory was was fully audited before being brought on board, albeit you tend to work with a a fairly limited supply base. It's not that you, you jump from factory to factory season on season. You have your key set of suppliers, um, but they were all fully audited they would be spot audited at, at regular intervals beyond that, just to make sure that uh, standards were, were continuing to be upheld. And then I think something that was kind of really impressive was the understanding that if, if a factory was found to be in breach, then they wouldn't just be cut loose, they would be educated and, and given a, a program and, and carefully supported to get themselves up to standard. Because, you know, not that, this was something that happened during my time with either business, but you, you hear of factories in our industry where people are getting paid a dollar a day or you know whatever the, the terrible salaries are. But the reality is if you just say, well, whoa, you know, we've just found out about this, this isn't good, and you close that down, well, that's that person's livelihood, as meagre as it is, is then gone. So, you know, it's it's terrible, but equally it's that's what they're having to live off. So they then go from a dollar a day to zero. So the emphasis on being able to help support those factories in just becoming better educated and, and being able to reach the standards, obviously the, there'd come a point where if there wasn't the willingness or the ability to get there, then more radical steps would be taken. But there was always a, a rehabilitation program that, that would be implemented if there were any issues further down the line. What was your experience like visiting factories? Did you go to any? Yeah, I did. So I, I went to factories across all over the world. I mean, and, and right throughout my career, I've been to factories in El Salvador, Peru, the US, right across Europe, China, uh, Sri Lanka, 
Thailand, all over the place. And I, I mean, I've, I've been really fortunate, I guess, that the brands that I have worked for have those high standards in terms of responsibilities, but also in terms of the, the product manufacture. Because as much as people can talk about the prices of any sort of branded apparel, really, there's a responsibility that comes with that. I think if you're just serving up garbage at a certain price with a with a logo on it, then you can't expect people to, to keep coming back and buying that. Whereas at the lower prices, if you're going into a, a fast fashion retailer and paying five quid for a pair of shoes, you know, surely something inside you is telling you that somebody else has paid the price during the, the process of getting those made and you and you have lower expectations of the quality of them. So for me, I mean it's it's always been a, a great experience to be able to to go out to the factories and see different cultures and, you know, really mix with people who are very much of that culture. You know, when you when you get onto the the shop floor and you're working with people on prototypes, these are working class people. These are their jobs. So you get to see a side of these countries that you wouldn't see just by going there on holiday. So did you ever, when you were visiting any of these factories, did you ever see conditions that sat uneasy with you or, you know, made you question your own company? No, not at all. Never. And I can honestly say that. And the, the same would go for any of the, the people that I worked with or, or that reported into me. When we spoke with Paul earlier in this episode from the Clean Clothing Campaign, he mentioned how in Indonesia, you know, we were talking about Nike and he mentioned in Indonesia, workers there were often paid about half as much as the living wage in the country or in their areas. What do you attribute, you know, to be the primary cause of, you know, those low wages? Well, I think there's always pressure to improve margins, whether that's from the board within the company or whether that's from the retailers that you're ultimately selling the products to. I think part of the, the challenge that, that brands face is, I, I think that the living wage is a, is a big challenge across every country, including the one that I'm sitting in right now. You know, and that's, that is a big issue for, for brands to be able to get their heads around of ensuring that the the right level of wages are being paid, but also in terms of parity across different industries that they're not even involved in. So if I, if I give you an example, the first time I went to Thailand, we went to the uh, the huge market over there that I, I believe is closed down now. And, and I was walking around with one of the guys that, that was based out there. We went onto some of the market stalls and, and he was saying how important it is to haggle the prices because they find that Westerners are too keen to... To, you know, oh, it's only it's only a couple of dollars. I'm not going to haggle that. Whereas in locally converted, that couple of dollars goes a long way. So he said they've been facing a, a bit of an issue where people from skilled professions were leaving those professions to go and work on market stalls because they could make more money by selling trinkets to um, to visitors. So you know, I think it's it's understanding the balance across the entire workforce the entire labor market and and how how that all works out because you know if, if sewing machinists are getting paid double what or no doctors are getting paid then it creates another issue these companies are giant multinational companies a lot of people might look at them and say you know why can't they pay a living wage why can't they improve the conditions of some of these workers you know what would you to say to that well, I think on a personal level, you know, I can't speak on behalf of, of the brands because I, you know, I don't work for any of them. You know, I, I think certainly there is more that can be done globally in all industries to ensure that wealth is more fairly spread out. You know, there's no, no two ways about that. I think there's very few brands or organisations that can really look themselves in the in the mirror and say, yep, yeah, you know, everything we do is entirely pure because there's always going to be pressure from shareholders, from consumers, from the retailers that are buying the product to sell to the consumers. You know, everybody along the line wants wants the best price they can get. You know, if if the if the price of football shirts went up to a hundred pounds instead of seventy pounds, you know, there'd be there'd be uproar. So I think it's not just on brands, it's on all of us, including end consumers, to 
do what we believe to be right. But then, you know, depending on what your own financial circumstances are, you're not always in a position to do that either. So, you know, it's it's not something that's got a simple answer. And I hope that I'm kind of coming across as, you know, I'm speaking from the heart here. I'm not trying to kind of meander my way through it or justify anything. I think right around the world, the, the inequalities of, of income and the pressures of what you really need to spend to have, you know, a living wage is one thing, but to have an enjoyable lifestyle is is something else again, you know, and how do how do we reconcile that against everything that's that's happening in the world and how capitalism is pretty much the be all and end all of our existence. You know, I want to finish up in a slightly different area. You know, we've been talking about the human cost of football kits. And, you know, it's not just in, you know, the production of them. But, you know, I know I was looking at your Twitter and, you know, counterfeiting is also a big issue, you know, when it comes to kind of the human cost of making shirts. So, you know, can you talk about maybe how counterfeiting fits into all of this? Yeah, I think it's... It's something that is under considered when we talk about the, the human cost of, of kits. And I think it kind of works in tandem with another human cost of kits, which is the end consumer. You know, if you're the football fan and you've got three kids and you want the new home shirt and the three kids all want, you know, the full kit, that's a lot of money to splash out every 12 months. You know, so of course it's, it's tempting to look elsewhere to see, well, you know, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get the kids the Villa kit, but he likes Real Madrid, but he's not, he's not a Real Madrid fan, so I'll just buy him a, a counterfeit one when I'm away on holiday. You know, but the, the conditions of the counterfeiting factories where the very fact that it's an illegal trade suggests that, you know, it's unlikely to be conditions that are the types of things that we would hold ourselves accountable to with audited factories and whatever else they usually are very poor conditions similarly the mills where the materials are coming from are likely to be very poor conditions as well quite often these factories are essentially an important part of organized crime so whether that's for money laundering or cash generation or both and then the money gets used on human trafficking drug trafficking arms terrorism you know, which sounds really far-fetched of like, oh, well, you know, can't be that bad. It's only a fake Real Madrid shirt. But, you know, you, you've got to follow that line of money all the way to the end. And I think within branded football shirts, I can certainly sit here and say, well, yeah, you know, this is what we would pay to, to get a shirt made for the brand. We know what the, the profit margin of the supplier is. We know what the fabrics cost us. We know what percentage we've got to pay to the club. We know what the retailer is willing to pay for it. We then know how much markup they want to make when they sell it on to the customer. So it may not be ideal, but at least we know where every chunk of that final retail price is going. Whereas you buy a counterfeit football shirt, you could be buying any other illegal product in the world, really. It's once you've paid for it, who knows where the, where the cash ends up. You know, in one sense, it's almost kind of a depressing thought, not in the idea of you want to buy something, you know, that's illegally made, but in that, you know, if you want to buy a shirt of your, you know, favorite club, there's a chance that if you buy the official one, you know, the person on the other end isn't really making a living wage and might not be under the best conditions. And also, you know, doubly so if you buy a counterfeit one, it, you know, makes you wonder, you know, if they're actual that many shirts that you know are sustainably made yeah no i mean i I, I think you you're right it is a difficult conundrum that i think as a fan it is a bit different than just buying branded gear for your kids you know you can always say well no you've already got three nike or adidas hoodies or whatever i'm not getting you another one but when you're a fan of a club it's it becomes something different and for the younger kids and you know i've been there i remember getting my first football shirts it's kind of the most important thing in the world, having the new kit. And I still remember now that for me, it was always, even though the kits would come out in the summer, it was always a, a Christmas present because it was too expensive to just, you know, mom and dad couldn't justify spending 30 quid on a 
on essentially a t-shirt in the middle of the year there'd have to be a reason but similarly the lifespan was more like two years then so they'd buy me for christmas and i'd still get another you know year and a half out of wearing it whereas now clubs have two three four kits every 12 months you know it's difficult but then you can point the finger at the club as well and say well why are you doing that you know so there's always going to be a reason why people want an additional slice of the pie there's always something else that's got to be paid for Paul Rowland is a campaigner for the Clean Clothes Campaign. Rob Warner is the co-founder and creative director of the design agency Spark. And in the past, he's worked for companies like Umbro, Puma, O'Neill, and Lululemon. The music for this episode was provided under the Creative Commons license by Blue Dot Sessions. And you can find more information about those music tracks in our episode description. This episode was produced by John McKenzie, I'm Josh Schneider-Weiler, and thanks for listening to Football Today. And before you go, if you're a fan of the show and would like to support us, please sign up to our Patreon page, where you'll get access to bonus episodes and extra content. And if you can't spare the cash, please tell a friend instead. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.